Hello boys and girls. I think this is going to be a very good video. <laughs> um, we are going to discuss uh, computationally enumerable sets and decidable sets and on the way be pretty um, hands-on, going to implement uh, a lot of these notions directly and see how they play out in some examples and accumulate enough um, terminology to eventually give a proof or the logic of the proof of the undecidability of the halting problem or I will say halting problem is a German word uh, from the super famous 1936 paper by Alan Turing in which he uh, defines the Turing machine and shows that they are indeed um, undecidable, unsolvable problems and we are going to discuss this eventually. But actually, I mean, this is great, uh, but the definition of the, uh, the computational en enumerability uh, is for me the heart of this video um, because I think the presentation will be novel in the sense that it's pretty explicit and you will find diagonalization arguments such as the undecidability of the halting problem, halting problem um, in other videos and, and sketches and in Wikipedia articles as well. But um, if you want to know what, what uh, like a semi-decidable or recursively enumerable or computationally enumerable set is, then uh, this video is, is going to teach you that. Um, so uh, let me point out that a related video is one from one or two years ago where I explain and implement in C-sharp um, a universal Turing machine and a lot of the history that led up and went beyond the Turing paper. Um, so if you want to see some history and, and what a Turing machine looks like, uh, then uh, look at that video. In this video, we're just going to um, have a wrapper that acts somewhat like a, a Turing machine in the sense that there's a, a state that is updated, but there's no details of uh, any Turing machine. So we, I'm, I'm going to use Python, uh, which is also a Turing computer language and th therefore uh, works. But uh, here's some history. And also in my argument regarding the halting problem of the end of the video, I will make use of the fact that we can, uh, given a fixed alphabet, I think a fixed symbol of letters, a uh, collection of letters, we can enumerate all legal statements or, or we can you know, go through all uh, legal strings and, and enumerate them and, and actually generate them associated with a number. That's what I do in a, a Python script in, in that video three, from three weeks ago. So we'll make use of that. Okay, so um, before we start, before we get into coding, I will just jump quickly into uh, the, the Wikipedia uh, links that I also link at the bottom of this video, uh, as I often do. Um, although I will not dwell on them too much because we will see and understand all the notions that are explained in the code better uh, than when you have to try to figure out from the descriptions in the Wikipedia article, I think. Okay, so uh, by the way, subscribe to this channel now if you have not done that yet. And so um, the interesting um, notion that we are going to discuss is the, the computable uh, and decidable sets and how that uh, differs from semi-decidable. So let, let, actually let me quickly read this paragraph because uh, this is the, the, the gist of what we're going to discuss in this video. So in computability theory, a set of natural numbers is called recursive, computable or decidable. If there's an algorithm which takes a, a number as an input, terminates after a finite amount of time, possibly depending on a given number, usually depending on a given number, and correctly decides whether or not the number belongs to the set or not. A set which is not computable is called non-computable or undecidable. And the more gen like, so let me like um, rephrase this again. So here we speak of um, an, an algorithm to which you feed the number and it gives you yes or no, zero, one, true or false, and thereby 
decides on a, a specification. So for example, if you have the set of um, all natural numbers and you're interested in all the prime numbers, then you might ask, is there an algorithm that, um, that you give any numbers, let's say 13, and it, it, it does its magic and it does its uh, you know, computation, however you implemented it, and in the end returns in a correct way, true or false, uh, depending on whether it's a prime number. So 13 would be a prime number, so it would return uh, true and if you pass it 16 then it would return false so this is a decides and so the point here is that you have a specification of your, what you wanted to do you have this logical predicate that you express in natural language or in logical language so for example as i just said i have uh, a boolean predicate true or false uh, where that that uh, attains a boolean value uh, true or false depending on whether or not the, any number of the natural numbers that I give you is a prime number. And now there is the question of can this, this specification, you know, this natural language specification or even logical language specification be translated to an algorithm which actually performs this. So, you know, um, an actual like uh, automatic procedure that you could hand over to a monkey and he does the steps like the, your computer and it arrives with an answer and the point of all of this is that just because you can specify a problem and it it is consistent it sounds consistent um doesn't mean that there that is actually even possible to have an implementation this is this is all what this is about so um and so uh Nonetheless, even if a problem is uh, undecidable and the halting problem that we will prove in this video is going to be one of these undecidable problems, there's another uh, notion, uh, like a uh, weaker version, uh, if you want. So uh, let me read. A more general class of sets um, than the decidable, decidable ones consists of the recursively enumerable sets, um, also called semi-decidable uh, or computationally enumerable. Um, for these sets, it is only required that there is an algorithm that correctly decides whether or not the number is in the set. So it decides in the true case, if, if for example, the prime number, uh, the number you pass is prime, then indeed it uh, decides. Otherwise, the algorithm may give no answer at all. So um the algorithm might not even terminate right so it's uh the, the decidable function the function that that this says yes or no that, that literally is an implementation of the boolean predicate is a total function in that sense that it whenever you give it a function uh, value it um, will return uh actually a value but not all um not all uh functions are total i mean you know you can write easily write a program that gets you in a for loop that never ends and so this is where the the, the unnice things uh, come into play why that's why computability theory is, has so many complicated aspects because you you might never be able to end the algorithm but uh the recursively enumerable sets and uh, what you can do with it even if they, they correspond to problems that are not decidable, uh, there's still so something to get out of this. So there is the article to recursively enumerable. Um, let me just get you through the pains of this. This is just a preparation, right? To also step through, through this first paragraph here. So um, in computability theory, traditionally called recursion theory, a set of natural numbers is called recursively enumerable, computationally enumerable, semi-decidable, provable, or truly recognizable. I will uh, probably stick most of the cases with uh, computa computably uh, enumerable or semi-decidable, depending on the context, um, but these are all synonymous. Um, so there are two ways of characterizing that, and we will see in the video why that is. So in the one hand, uh, it's one characterization of these um, computa computably enumerable sets. There is an algorithm such, such, set, uh, such that the set of input numbers for which the algorithm holds is exactly S. Or equivalently, there is an algorithm that enumerates the members of S. 
the, that means that its output is simply the list of all members. So the small s's are elements that they come um, one after another pop out of this um, enumeration algorithm. And if necessary, this algorithm may also, you know, never end. Um, okay, then here comment on the nomenclature and some complexity relations. Okay, so and we will we will literally see why both of these um, descriptions uh, make sense. How this this equivalence comes together because we are going to um, implement actually this this. A very general wrapper for that do, does this enumeration given a certain class of algorithms. Um, okay, so the the whole thing is about computability theory. So computable function is of course um, um, a main topic there, um, but uh, let me not uh, go into that too much. Of course, here we have also um, the notes on uh, the computable sets relations uh, so here, here's also a, a quick definition of this a characterization of uh, the innumerable sets and semi decidable sets um, and uh, these are just buzzwords so decision problems are uh, this this yes no questions for input values in this case we are going to talk about subsets uh, of the natural numbers the halting problem is a particular decision problem that we will Proof undecidable. Um, I will make a note on, you know, since this is also about sets, and there's um, a related subfield of set theory called descriptive set theory. Um, I will come back to this uh, axiom of specification quickly, and one of the examples will be in implementation of the Kohler's conjecture, and we will talk a little bit about that for exemplary purposes. So the interesting thing about this conjecture is that is one where um, where it's not clear whether or not it is um, undesirable but it's not clear whether or not it's desirable that's the same thing um, and so we can implement that and we can see that we can enumerate uh, a lot of uh, you know numbers for which the Kohler's conjecture comes to a halting the implementation despite us not knowing whether or not this is desirable at all. So here we will see the, the difference between um, what, what, the desire, what, what room we still have even if something might not be desirable. And lastly, there is the notion of dovetailing. This is a sort of parallelization um, or at least you know running in parallel several uh, different machines. And uh, there's, I think this is um, from uh, Udacity. There's this page where they also discuss computability theories, and I, I will come back to this, to this, uh, this image. Okay, so I'm sorry for all these precursors, um, and I hope you're not confused yet uh, too much. Um, but in in while we go through all the computations, I will reflect back and maybe even come back to this these articles to make you understand these concepts. Um, a little bit better. Um, okay, so here is again my uh, usual setup. I, I do scripting here, I do run the programs here. So Python, halting, pi, and hello world, it works. Um, and so, yeah, I've already touched upon, of course, uh, possible programs that might never help. So let, let me uh, just give you here a stupid example. Um, an implementation of a function that actually never halts on the input, right? So here I have this value while true. This will, will always uh, execute. And what happens here? We pass an input argument x and it flips it from x to minus x and then back and never holds with that. So here is an example of, of course, an, an, um, a function that never holds. We can actually try what, what will happen uh, if I call this on free, let's say. Yeah, then uh, he goes into the computation of this thing, uh, but never comes to an end, so I have to manually break out of that. Okay, so this is an example of a function which is in the 
in the in the, the worst case situation of a, a non-total function there are no values that i could pass so that this function on natural numbers would ever return a value um, but um, uh, beyond that uh, i come back to this distinction which is, is necessary to like really grasp some of these definitions like if you look at the definition of computable function uh, they all often repair, refer to whether or not a function is defined and they switch back and forth between implementation and the lo logical expression so i want to highlight again there's these two notions of of predicates uh, one just in the logical language where you specify what you want uh, say you know i want a set of all these things and then there's the question of actually like constructively so to speak uh, generating and implementing a um, procedure to actually get the information to, to actually compute uh, whether or not the property holds whether or not uh, 13 is a prime number how, how to actually compute that and so um, for the finite case uh, however things are usually um, very like graspable and uh, the proofs are pretty short because you can usually go through all the possible cases so let me start this out with a short set example okay so we don't need this function f anymore okay, i will delete this um so let's say we have a bounded set that i call bounded set um and that's a few numbers between 3 and 40 okay so you can print this thing so these are these, the set of these numbers. Um, and now I'm interested in the following uh, predicates, the following property. I want to consider all the natural numbers that are multiples of seven, right? So um, it's easy to see that, that we can implement that actually like this predicate from the natural numbers to the to the booleans uh, with a total function, we, we say, you know, let's say, decides, uh, you know, how do I call this? Multiple of seven, decide m seven, and to which we pass a natural number and return. And now comes the you know Python syntax for computing how the, uh, you find out whether or not the number is multiple of seven. You say n mod seven equals zero so if that's the case if that is zero then this will be true and we will we'll return uh, whether or not this is a multiple of seven so and what i can do with this now is i can take the, the bounded set and enumerate all the the numbers in the bounded set that actually fulfill the this property here and i do it like that i say you know bounded uh enumeration let's say um and we say x for x in this bounded set if this predicate is true for x right so this will be a list this will filter out everything and we say print me the set and let's run this so we see this is the set with with all the you know the bounded set of all whatever uh, 37 numbers and these are the numbers within that set that are multiples of seven right so seven is there eight is not a number multiple of seven there's also not eventually 14 is one so we can filter this out and this this filtering out, out process you know this is very simple uh, yet you know this is maybe uh, i don't want to drag this on but we will then uh, no since we're going to uh, later consider not the situation on the bounded set, I'm, I'm emphasizing that. Um, all these things correspond to this axiom uh, scheme of specification, where we say that if we have, uh, like this is an axiom of set theory, that where we say that if we have um, some, some uh, predicate and some set, then we can use the predicate to filter fr from the set. We can take the predicate and, and, and drop everything that does not fulfill the set for which the, the, uh, the, pr the predicate for which the predicate says this is wrong and so it looks like this um, like uh, skipping uh, the, all these arguments like these w's now 
the, the axiom scheme says that for every predicate, that's why it's a, a scheme because it's actually a collection of axioms, that for every predicate um, phi and for all sets A, this is the, the, in our example, this was the bounded set, there is another set B, this is the filtered set, such that for all elements, if the elements are um, so if the elements are in A, in the bounded one, in the, in the example at least, and the predicate holds, the and predicate holds, then they are also in B. So this is a way of using this predicate to filtering out uh, from A and, and this axiom says, uh, we guarantee you per axiom there exists the B such that um, the, the, uh, the filtered out, out version of A um, is also a set, okay? Um, so far, so clear, I hope. Now, um, what we are actually now going to do is we are going to write a, 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 a machine or a, a runner um, that, uh, where that will be very generic and that we are going to use in the rest of the video. Uh, it will be so generic that I will be able to implement this this uh, bounded enumeration procedure and we will then directly be able to use this this machine, this machine class wrapper. Um, also, for example, for the colors conjecture, but then also demonstrate um, and other different uh, properties that relate to non-halting. Okay, so we're going to define a class called machine um, that we're going to initialize with uh, similar, like it, it helps a little bit if you know what the, how the Turing machine is, but you will also understand it if you, from this video um, without uh, having seen it before. The, these machines are characterized by um, by a changing state, and um, we have some accepting states that tell us when we should halt, halt and, and some rejecting states that tell us also when we should halt but reject something, uh, like the output. And then also each uh, Turing machine is characterized by a transition function, which I will call update step in this, in this, uh, for this machine. So we have this accept states and we have the reject states and then we have this update uh, step that we have to pass. So we will, we're going to characterize our um, machine by these three parameters. And uh, as you have seen, uh, in this video, we talked just about functions on the natural numbers, but for functions on any uh, like countable domain, um, we can you know encode whatever sort of input we have uh, into a natural number in some, fa some fashion, um, certainly for Turing machines. Um, and uh, that's why uh, this is, I mean, Practically speaking, here restriction, but doesn't uh, uh, doesn't water down the statements that I'm going to make. And also, computability theory is, is also literally about uh, functions on general numbers. So that's just a comment. Um, so uh, if we initialize that, well, we are going to give this machine accepted states, and then also a bar. Then also uh, halting states, which are going to be both the, the accepted states and the rejected states. So these are all the, the states in, on which the machine halts. And if the states land in the accepted state set, uh, then the return value is to be, to be considered true. You will see in a second how this plays out. Um, and then a function that is the update step that is also passed. So, um, and now uh, we're going to give the machine the, the run method, which um, input, which will uh, use the update step, whatever the, the update step is, to simulate the, uh, for example, um, this computation here. 
So, uh, I mean, uh, spoiler ahead for the, the first machine. We are, uh, so let me comment this out for a second and, and show you where this is going to end up with. Um, we're going to implement the run operation to execute uh, performance of update steps on the state. And then I will call this naive uh, trial to decide something. So this will be a uh, diversion of the decide function. Um, and so this will work like that. Uh, it will say return self run on n in accept state. So this will try to mimic uh, a decision by first running the whatever algorithm is defined by the update step and then return the, the final state and if the state is exact is indeed a acceptance state then this will be true if not it will be false uh, why we have this this uh, wrapper on this bigger setup is that we are not only going to deal with a total function we're not only going to deal with functions that actually terminate this is why i call this a trial where right? this is a naive trial to decide something and okay so to spoil um to mimic this uh, multiple of seven function we are going to have this uh, mod seven step uh, that takes some number that i will call state in this case so this is when it's not a member of the, the machine anymore this is what the state the, that we use to implement this, this thing and the new state this is just one step in this calculation of the mod. So this is state minus seven, right? And then return the new state. Um, and we're going to print something out here as well. We're going to say, uh, we're going to tell us what the transition is. So we, see, we make something like, we're going to say what, how the state changed from state to new state. Okay, and so then, the machine corresponding to the above algorithm that I will call machine seven um, will work like like so. We were going to have the accept state whenever you know whenever uh, n modulo seven is zero, then it's true. So the accept state will be uh, zero, and otherwise all the others below seven. So if for example ten mod seven is free. And this is not a multiple of seven, so it will be rejected. This, these are the accept states. This will be the rejection states, and the function, the update function, will be this. So and this uh, will work like that. So um, how and then you know the the execution will be, for example, this. This will return. Uh, this will be, this will return uh, f the state f the uh, state free and this this will return false, for example, right? Because this is not a multiple of seven. So uh, what is the implementation of this run? It's not hard. Um, so we're going to need in this video two uh, libraries, by the way. So from time import sleep. I, I use the sleep simply so that the input, the, the output, if there's a lot of output, is not like put onto the terminal display all at once. And from copy import copy. So I could uh, code around that, but the copy function must just makes a deep copy and makes some, some uh, computations easier. So what I will do for the run is the following. Um, first, we we're going to the take the input which we will turn which we will interpret as the initial state of the machine computation and here i wrap this into the copy so that i don't have to touch the this n again um and then i say um while if this state uh, is not in not in any of the halting states Um, then do this update new state equals and now we have this method 
And as soon as it's in the halting state, then we can return the state, right? So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I have to update the state, of course. State is no state. So I could, of course, you know, also just uh, drop these, like merge these two, but for explanatory purposes, I put it in two lines. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So let's actually check it. Um, let's let's debug it. Let's say. <laughs> Uh, let's see if the naive trial to decide on 10. Uh, okay, so what have I done wrong? Um, aha, here, self. Right, so so here we see um, this. Okay, uh, let me comment out the old computations here. Um, the old print statements. So, okay, so now I, I run this trial on the number 10 and it tells me, um, he reduces 10 to seven and this is not uh, this is in the in the not uh, rejecting states. It's not it's not in the accepting state, so this is false. If we go to twenty, then it goes from twenty to thirteen, for thirteen to six, and it's again false. If we go to twenty one, then he goes to zero, and it's true. So you see, this is this machine is really just a wrapper where I broke the computation of this this uh, reduce re reduction. Of the 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 state uh, to into into small parts, so I, I do this manually now, going down by seven every time and characterize whether or not this is true or false with with accepting or uh, rejecting states. And I, I just make use of the accepting states by checking whether or not the output of the execution is in there, right? So we can do now the same thing that we did again uh, above with. Um, with this bounded enumeration, let me actually copy that. So, of course, I can you know, comment this in again. And here, uh, also now use this machine with the this decision. And hopefully, it will be twice the same result. Um, okay, let me quickly comment out all these computations. So yeah, we see this is the exact same result because it's the exact, exact same implementation. And if I comment in these state transitions, then um, there are of course a lot of, a lot of uh, computations involved in reducing stuff. Okay, that works. Um, can also comment it out. And so now, now to the collapse conjecture. If you don't know it, I will quickly describe it. This is another problem. Like now we had the, the, the question of deciding whether or not uh, a number is a multiple of seven. The collapse conjecture looks as follows. Um, th this is a description of an algorithm that tries to, um, it basically it, it, it works like this. You, you give it a number. If the number is one, then you're done. If the number is even, then you divide it by two. If the number is uneven, then you t take the number, multiply it by three and add one and thus get a bigger number. And so let me give you an example of what it looks like. Uh, let's take the example from here. So if we start with the number 12, then this is an even number by the rule that I just described. We divide it by two. This is again an even number. Let's divide it by two again. Then we add three. Three is not an even number. We cannot divide it by, by two in the natural numbers. So we multiply it by three and add one. So three times three is nine plus one is 10. And this is the next number. This is even, so we get down to five. And this is now um, again uneven. We multiply it by three and add one. Now we are 16. So we, we actually went up 
but now we can do 16 divided by 2 is 8 uh, but divided by 2 is 4 but divided by 2 is 2 and then we are at 1 and so we see this this uh, sequence uh, terminates at 1 again uh, like um, eventually all known numbers all that have been tried and I don't know they have been tried like billions and trillions they uh, it turns out that these collets uh, numbers like they all the, the collet starting numbers all reduce to one so I give you another example the 19 here 19 is big so it's not even multiplied gets to 58 this is even divided by 2 now we get even higher but then we are at 88 can go down to 11 but then it goes up again uh, and so on and so forth eventually we go to one and this is an e interesting problem because it's it's kind of easy to define and at the same time uh, it is an and it's unknown is mathematicians do not know whether or not um, there is any number that you can pass to this algorithm to this simple algorithm so that it does not go to one all all numbers that have been tried go down to one no number is known that does not go to one again. No, no number is known that just you know loops on forever. Let's say. Um, so this is a, a, a yet unsolved problem in, in mathematics, and um, I mean it's not obvious, but as Turing showed in 1936, there are indeed unsolvable problems, and so people conjecture. That it might be that this the Collard's conjecture, the idea that this always go back, back to one, might be an unsolvable problem actually. So it's not not just that we just don't know an, an counterexample. It might be that it's impossible to find out uh, if there is a counterexample or not. It might be that this is undecidable um, algorithmically um, for a number uh, for like that you have one procedure, one algorithmic procedure that. Uh, can tell you um, whether or not the number will go down to one, uh, and the, the the question of whether or not this um, the problem even has has a solution um, as a problem is not known. So there, there's a lot of mystery with there. The point of this is my point of this is that um, we're going to implement it now, and the joke is that. We will work with it and say make make statements about the, the, you know we will enumerate solutions for example, despite us not actually knowing whether or not the algorithm terminates. And the point is that it doesn't matter for the enumeration, the decidability, uh, like to to query whether or not um, a number will always go to one doesn't matter for the for the semi decidability that we're going to implement. Okay, so, um, good, uh, let me go back here. So, now that we have our, our machine, this is actually very uh, simple to implement. We implement uh, just this step, right? So, I say, I call this collard step, and we can pass a state, and so the new state, simple, uh, similar to above, will be the implementation of the algorithm that I just described. What was it? Well, multiply by three uh, and add one if the number is uneven. So if st state mod two um, is one, so this is uh, you know in Python I could write now is one. I don't have to. Uh, otherwise. Uh, take the state, this number, and divide by two, and we're going to cast this to an integer just so the result looks pretty and doesn't have any floating point zeros. Um, and that's basically it. So we can also here, of course, print out the result, would be good, and and re return the new state. And then the, the machine, which I will call ma machine collats, uh, will have Obviously, the halting state, the acceptance state on, uh, rejection state in this case uh, none. We don't. Ha we have no number upon which we don't just continue, and the collard step is the update function. Okay, so let's also try this collards on. Opa, on 
some number. So let's do this naive try to decide on two, two, three, some number. Well, as you see, this is pretty long. Uh, whoa. So, up. Oh, okay, let me comment out the uh, whatever other computation is done here. Okay, so we start with 223. This is uneven, so we multiply it by 3 and add 1. We go to 600. This is even, we break down 300 something. This is uneven, we go down up to 1000 and so on. And we actually blow up, like you see, we, we even go through 3000 something. We go to 7000, I see here. But eventually we go down and end up at 1688 and this, this routine and add 1, right? And, you know, we can try this with a bunch of numbers. 80 would be probably shorter. Right. And let's go with the 19. This is also on the Wikipedia page. Yeah, you know, we, we had this before, if you remember. Okay, so that works. You see with this machine, we just have to implement the, the state update. We don't have to implement the algorithm because the run function does it for, for us. And so, the joke is, I call this naive try to decide because uh, this is actually not necessarily a total function, right? As I've, uh, as I've argued, uh, it might be that it's not the case that all um, inputs to the Collard's uh, algorithm go down to one again. So it might be that there are inputs where this just loops on and blows up forever. People don't know it. I mean, people doubt it, but it's not proven. So this naive try to decide uh, function is not provably total. It's not clear that this will halt. That's why I call it try to decide. It will try to decide. It will actually try to run it, but it might never halt. And so this brings us to the next, uh, the next little thing that we will implement. Um, so we have a method for if the number if the color conjecture like if f our number for example 19 it goes down to one then we can uh, be sure that this naive try and decide will actually tell us the correct answer it will run the computation we have to might have to wait very long but eventually this will uh, go down to one in the case of 19 for example and so we have a method to decide the positive cases and I want to emphasize this because it will come back again. We have a method now to decide uh, the cases where it's positive, but the negative cases, the, the cases in which um, the, the thing goes on forever, that we will never get to, we will just wait on, we will never get a, a no, because the, there's no uh, rejection state in a sense. We, we have no, not implemented a way that, that tells us no, this does never. Um, Halt, you know, we, we don't know it. We have we, we didn't implement it. We have no clever decide function for that. Um, so we have we have a one-sided situation, and this is exactly what the the semi-decidability is about. So the, we can now judge the positive cases, and what we can do now is we can actually write a a, a way to enumerate all the positive cases we can all the, the cases that are, are that will eventually be accepted we can actually enumerate them in a forever ongoing process uh, and for this we will make use of the the stuff tailing which is the, we were going to implement this this sort of quotes and quotes parallelization and and how will that work well that's why i have this nice picture here so um if if m is my my machine um that are, uh, can run on, on inputs such as 19 and 223, what we're going to do is we are going to run it on all inputs. Okay, uh, one caveat, this is of course assuming that I have infinite uh, space, right? I cannot do infinite computations because eventually my, my computer will break, <laughs> uh, uh, overflow with information. Um, but uh, up, like this is part of the computability theory that you assume you have an infinite uh, storage. Um, but uh, that aside, we will, what we're going to do is we, we are going to um, 
do computations for all possible inputs. And so how do we approach this? Well, what we, not, what we cannot do is the following. We cannot uh, simply go to the first one, compute uh, if it got, uh, terminates in the Collatz conjecture at one, um, and then go to the next one, use two and try it, three and try, four and try. Um, why can we not do that? Well, if, for example, there's some one number, let's say one bajillion Google Plex something, if there's some number which does not actually hold, you know, we don't know, then with the simple procedure that we just do all after another, then we would uh, eventually end up with um, this number and then never hold and never get to later numbers. So what we instead do, and that's why I have implemented this machine with the stepwise computation, um, we're going to take the first value, zero, okay? Uh, here it starts with empty string, but um, I, I will probably start with one actually. Um, but okay, we start with one, um, here, okay, let's say we start with one, we, we make one computation step, we're not computing the, the value one to the end, but we're just doing one update step, right? So for example, in the case of, in the case of um, the mod seven, we're go just going to do this one update step if, um, if necessary. Um, and then uh, we're going to actually go to the next input argument and we're going to compute M of two, for example, and do one uh, input step. And then um, in the next step, we're going back uh, to the first machine, do another step, then go to back to the, the uh, second argument, do another step, and then add an, an, another argument. So, okay, maybe that was a little bit confusing. It goes like this. We, are, we have our machine, which we want to run on different uh, input arguments. What we not do is take one argument, compute it to the end, done, next argument, compute it to the end. No, that's not what we do. What we do is we take the first argument, make just one step of the computation. Then we go to another machine, uh, like machine for the another argument, do also just one step. And then do for the first machine, the second step. As is first machine, I mean the, the machine on the first argument. And then um, we add the machine with, with, the, with another uh, argument, right? And compute for all these three machines one step. And then we add a fourth argument, like machine with fourth argument, and add and compute one step for, for all of this. So basically, uh, each machine that came earlier will always be one step ahead of the next one, right? So this, I hope this picture kind of explains it. So we, are, we have all these different input arguments to the machine, uh, and we, we go like this. So we compute for, for one, um, machine the first argument and then, uh, and then for another machine the, this uh, the, the second and then we add a, a, a next one to one step here to the second step for this to the first step for this then we add another one to the first step here to the second step for this one the first step for this and the fourth one there basically we, we, we make this kind of uh, zigzag or you no know, this jumping and and always to one step at a time and always adding more and more input arguments. And in this way, uh, eventually we're going to do all computational steps. Like if you go to infinity, we're go to, going to do all computational steps for all the machines. The, the, the machines that we added, the, the input arguments that we added earlier, um, will always be like a little bit further. But in this, this kind of, with this trick, this, this dovetailing here, we are going to see all computational step eventually, right? I hope that makes sense. It was a little bit fuzzy explanation, but um, uh, I hope you got the gist anyway. But nevertheless, we're going to see it implemented now anyway, so there's no there's no worry if that was a little bit sketchy. Um, so we're going to implement this as actually a method of the machine. So we're going to call this dovetail run, dovetailing run. They will actually be basically the implementation of this, um, except for not just one argument, but we're going to run for all arguments. This is, this is all that it, this is. So um, 
we're going to start with the index one in this case that I will call la uh, latest index. You know, we could start with any index, but let's start with the, the one. This is the, the, the first input argument. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go through all these computations and some eventually some of these machines will end. Some of these machines will end with their computation. And in that case, uh, we, what we're going to do, we're going to take the output result from this, this procedure and print the output. And so what happen, What will happen is that after a time, uh, one after another, we're going to just accumulate uh, all the values for which the output is, is true, right? The, the ones for which the output never holds, they will never hold. They will do like a lot of wasted uh, computational steps there as well. But all those which will eventually hold will all be collected eventually. So this is a way of enumerating, of computing this computational uh, enumeration of all uh, values for which the implementation gives a positive result. And th this is the magic here. We, we have the specification, we want something. Um, and we can enumerate all the positive values, even if we just have implement an implementation that is such that the positive values uh, have a re positive return value and the negative values uh, might run on forever. So this is not a total function. It's not a, a, a decision that we make. It's not an uh, implementation of a decision uh, procedure, but it's just a one-sided um, uh, computation of the positive values and that's why it's called semi-decidable. Um, so we're going to col collect this enumerated right? and, and you can see that this, this computation will go on forever. We can of course at any time hold if we like or if we see a result that we like we can exit the computation but in, I will implement it at first in a way that we'll just collect all uh, values, enumerate all the right values. Okay, so uh, this will be our, our list, our enumeration. Uh, this enumerated will be our uh, enumeration of all the values and the running will be, will hold all the indices as well as the states of the machine computations that are still ongoing, right? So this is going to run forever. So we'll go with while true. We'll just go through all the steps. Um, here uh, we are go at every step we're going to add one uh, new input argument to the computation so we start out with running of the latest index and we're going to initialize it at the value so this, this is this setting is akin to this copying here right I could also do copy make it even more closer to that um, and then I will I'll do a bunch of printing here so add index so also going to print out what you have so far um, and then we say for uh, all indices and states in the running system dot items. So we're going to go through the list and this list will grow with time and also um, eventually sh shrink if we don't, uh, if we are done with computations. If um, the state is not in the halting states so remember we're here in the machine so this has this knows about its halting states um, then do the update then do this this update so this is really literally just this except with another uh, for loop so um, um, can directly copy that except for the state is of course now um, the running state of that index right so here's the update if it's not in a halting state 
Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise we're done with with that particular index, right? So we can actually delete this. I mean, we can also leave it in there, but there's no point to it, and it will just take longer then. And we're going to print that the the index was reduced to uh, the state. So. This is just information. Um, and then, uh, so in, there might be a, a positive and you know, rejection st uh, states and, and acceptance states. And so we have to also implement uh, this here. So we say, if the state is in the acceptance states already, then add it to the enumerated states. Ah, the index. Yeah, the, the index. This is this is uh, characterizes the machine. Or uh, this is sorry. I'm always saying machine because the the uh, halting problem will actually identify these numbers with machines. That's why I'm confusing this. Um, but in this case, it's just uh, so the some some input number. Um, and then we print that we accepted that. Okay. Um, apart from that, we may also print again at each iteration of this loop. Why not? Um, and also to, to, for the sake of not um, printing too much stuff, I would sleep here. Okay, and the, after each iteration, of course, I have to raise this index. Okay, so I hope this was not too much. This is like basically a, a, a breadth uh, first version of just this running, right? This is the implementation of this. We have this growing list of this running um, dictionary which holds the numbers so these are the the numbers that we work on and this is the how, how far it has been removed so far uh, you will see unless i made a, a bug um, in a second how that actually works so let's try it out so we take our machine seven right this is the the, the machine that finds out whether or not uh, numbers are multiple of seven and do a dovetailing run so and if i have all print statements then that should be it already um okay machine seven is not defined ah So here, small typo. Yeah. Okay, I will uh, run. This goes on forever now. Let me break that. So let's actually check this out, what it does. Okay, so it starts out with the input one uh, and sets its first state one. It has so far not accumulated any um, results, not a any like the with this desirable property um one is already um is reduced to one uh, uh because you know one is already a number in the in the um, sorry for the machine seven th these are the the rejecting states one is reduced to one but uh, not what we want so this is just kicked out then index two is added, same spiel. Two is not multiple of seven, it's all kicked out, kicked out, kicked out, kicked out. And then eventually um, seven is added. Seven is seen to be uh, uh, in one step reducible to zero. So um, the new state is zero and this is 
and then you know it adds it's eight words first with eight but then it sees oh that uh, this will actually be accepted so seven is added now to the enumerated things and then eight is reduced to one uh, it's discarded and so on and so forth everything is always discarded except the ones that are multiples of seven and so here eventually um, the 14 is also added so see and uh, suddenly we, this, this list grows and in this way you see that I mean in, in, in that case um, we have the acceptance and rejection state so we have the full information and everything is total computable but you see how we, we like go through all the possible inputs and accumulate and accumulate and eventually we will have all multiples of seven in this way so m more interesting is this if we run the dovetailing on the collats so let me do that as well okay good enough so this is much more complicated the step is much more complicated here um, so what happens uh, one is added one is uh, immediately accepted because it reduces to one immediately this is the um, condition for the collats two is added Okay, two also is even divides by two, so it's, it's reduced to one. Three is added. Um, op. Two uh, is seen to be uh, reduced to one and thus accepted. Three is uneven, multiplied by three, plus one is, is ten, so the new state is higher. Uh, four is added. Um, this ten is divided by two, like the, the three state is now five. Uh, 4 is reduced to 2, um, 5 goes up to 15, 2 is reduced to 1, and therefore the, the 4 will sh soon be accepted, and so on and so forth. And we, you know, we can run this, and at, at this stage, for example, we have already, um, like, the, you know, the, the powers of 2 are, are seen to be, uh, to end very quickly, but then some others are also, so here we, we enumerate, all, we collect all the values for which the Quarles conjecture uh, actually holds. And, and th the joke here is that even if the Quarles conjecture might not terminate, like even if the computation for some number would go on forever, uh, then, well, then we do a lot of unnecessary computational steps, but it doesn't matter. This program will still go on and accumulate all the values for which it is true. So this dovetailing procedure uh, enumerates everything um, for which the algorithm is, is positive even if the negatives are not even terminating even if it's not total and, and so um, with that example let's go back to to um, to this uh, recursively enumerable definition so these are the um, these things that we talk about here so I will read this again and now with the, what we've just seen probably makes more sense in computability theory, traditionally called recursion theory, a set S of natural numbers is called recursively enumerable or computationally enumerable or semi-decidable. If there is an algorithm such that the set of input numbers for which the algorithm holds is exactly S, right? So the, the, the underlying algorithm that um, decides positively if it's true and might not uh, like will not halt if it's it's not true or equivalent equivalently there's an algorithm that enumerates the members of s that's what we just implemented um, that means that its output is simply a list of members so this is the list that we're generating if necessary yeah if the set is infinite the, this will go on forever okay so and uh, i guess it's also uh, we can now better understand uh, the, a few arguments that will eventually make it pretty clear that there are problems which are not decidable. So again, decidable just means that we actually have a total function that we, if we give it an argument, it, it, it clearly returns true or false, right? Um, it is clear that if a problem is decidable, then we can uh, find the this this function in the definition of semi-decidable that I just uh, read out, right? So 
let me uh, be more precise. Let's say we have a function that decides, decides some problem x, right? We have some problem x and this is a function that, that decides this. We have this at hand. Then we can now easily define um, the, a function that returns whenever a, a number is, uh, is true on this uh, problem x and goes on forever if it's not true, namely, um, okay, we, let's call this uh, return for x uh, on n true. So the problem x is, is for example, multiple of seven um, and else um, don't hold. Okay, so we define this function uh, on n as follows while true if uh, this is positive and if this is um, one or true then return and this function it's clear that this function will re uh, return exactly when the predicate or the problem x is true. Now, if for for uh, for n, if for the input number x is true, then it will go into the loop. It will return true here, and then um, return, and the function will return. Otherwise, if for this value n, the predicate is false, then this will say false. This will return step will be skipped, and this the whole thing uh, loops over. So this function now uh, is the analogous uh, function to the, the decidable function except this is never looping on the the wrong the negative cases on the rejection cases right so the, the decide function true and false for uh, accept and reject and and this this uh, weaker function true returns or gives true for positive uh, cases for accepted cases but never returns for for um, the rejection cases so we see that a decidability uh, implies that we have this um, partial or one-sided function uh, which is enough for doing an, an enumeration right as we have just seen we we didn't need uh, an uh, we didn't need an um, a return value to do to perform the enumeration right sorry um, and um, uh, on the other hand we will uh, now uh, give an, an argument why just having um, the just having uh, an, a semi-decidable uh, set doesn't mean it's also decidable. So let's actually look at, uh, at the other case first. So again, say, say we have this decidable function, then what we can also do is um, consider this function, return for x on x false, if it's false. So we just make a small modification, we do it like this. Then now this function is such that if n is false, in the negative cases, the reject cases, then this will return. Otherwise, it will um, go on forever. And um, so what we can say is that we, if we have both of those, if we have implementations for both, like let's say in a, a case where we don't have the, 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 the deciding function, but if we have those functions, those two halves, so to speak, you know, these two halves, the one that uh, accepts, like returns on positives and goes on forever on, on negatives, and the one that uh, accepts negatives but goes on forever with, with positives. These are two halves, basically. If we have both of those, then uh, we can also reconstruct a decision procedure. Right? This is easy because both of these um, halves ha ha also work on a machine, uh, have steps. So what we can do is we take a, an an input argument and do one st uh, step 
here, one step here, one step here, one step here. And if we have actually these both cases, then eventually um, one of them will return, right? So if, if uh, on the input argument, the, the predicate is, you know, is either true or false. And so either this will return or that will return. And in that case, we'll just return the value. So if we have both halves, then we have to decide the, 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 we can make the decision. If we have the decision, then we get both halves as, as we just saw, yeah? From the decision, we can make both halves. From both halves, we can make the decision. But uh, as Turing showed now, uh, it is possible that you have one half, so you have a semi-decidable problem, and you can never get to the decision. And the argument goes as follows. <laughs> okay, so the, this is not, this, you know, inverts the proof of the, uh, the halting problem, um, if you grasp all the things that came up to now. So um, we have seen in the, uh, the video three weeks ago that we can enumerate all the strings, right? We can take an alphabet. Let's say we take all possible characters that I can um, use on this, on this laptop that I'm currently recording this. Um, we can generate all the possible strings, uh, which means we can also in particular generate all possible, possible Python uh, programs. So everything that you see here, this would be like a one long string. So it will eventually show up in my enumeration. I can write in Python a Python parser that takes a big string and checks whether or not it corresponds to a legal Python program that, let's say, I can check whether or not it corresponds to a legal Python function that um, takes a natural number argument. Okay, so uh, what I just described is that for every natural number, there is some string, and these uh, may or not may or may not be uh, valid Python functions. Um, we will um, we can now in the dovetailing fashion go for all these numbers and um, and check at each step when we add a new number is this actually a python function if not then we can later also skip it or consider it's like terminated um, but otherwise we can also then feed it arguments a particular argument and so what turing says is you uh, you take a natural number compute the whatever the corresponding python function is if it's a python function then uh, feed this python function its own number, its own index in the enumeration as an input. Right? So it's, it's, it's clear that we can define a program that we give a natural number. This program looks up which Python function in my enumeration corresponds to this natural number and then executes the, this Python function on the, its own index. right? And then depending on whatever um, Python function we got there, this will, this computation or will terminate or will not terminate, right? Um, what is clear is that we can now enumerate all the Python programs that halt on their own input, right? We can do this dovetailing operations. In this case, um, the, the, the function that we will do in the dovetailing is we take the natural number, compute the path program associated with it, feed it and start the computation and see if it ever ends or not. A lot of Python functions will not end, but a lot of them will. And these will eventually in our process all be printed, right? So we can enumerate all Python functions that halt on their own input. Um, and so now, uh, Turing asks, however, uh, is there um, the corresponding thing to, to this thing? Is there a, a function? Can there be a, an implementation, a Python function, which, which takes a natural number, gets as the other function, um, the Python uh, function corresponding to the number in the enumeration, takes it also its own uh, index as, as like its own index as an, an input value and solves the following problem, uh, like half-sided problem. Please, if the program uh, like 
on its own index never halts, then uh, re then return. Otherwise, uh, you might go on forever, right? So the, the, this this uh, the question is the the specification that I just characterized take and the index run the function on their own index and return if this never returns so it, it, the property is does this thing never return um, this is a specification that I can write down in the log logical language or natural language uh, but now we can actually uh, and this will also be necessary to decide whether or not a function holds at all because then we have both parts um, but we can easily see that this function cannot exist because if you uh, feed this function if you were to feed this function if it existed if you feed this function to itself then you have a contradiction because if the function on itself holds um, then that means that the function on itself never holds and if it never holds then it must ho uh, hold right so you have this liar paradox situation that you define the function to have the property if the input never holds, then return, uh, or if it returns, then go on forever. And so if you feed it itself, then you have uh, both situations uh, at the same time. So the, you have a contradiction. And so you can logically conclude that this sort of function uh, doesn't exist, but that function uh, must exist if the problem whether or not a, uh, a program holds or not is decidable or not, right? So uh, as I've uh, argued before, um, if you have a, uh, if you have solved the decision pr procedure, then you can easily implement this half-sided um, implementation for both sides, right? If if this decision problem is solved, then you get the half-sided version in each case. But uh, we have just shown that there is this problem for which this half-sided situation can net can never be implemented because it's a contradiction and so we know that the the whole problem of deciding whether another function holds that we would use for this implementation um, cannot exist and so we have an undecidable problem and that was the first undecidable problem okay so I, this was a little bit long wider than I was like a little bit uh, uh, you know this was not a proper lecture because I, I made it a li little bit up on the fly um, but uh, uh, like even if uh, you have to now uh, uh, still go back and go to the Wikipedia page on um, the halting problem where in a little bit more cumbersome way uh, this is also explained so you have sorry you have also this uh, if it halts then loop forever um, and you have this this games you know with the negation so here is this explained in a little bit more mathematical terms um but they don't have the implementation of the enumerability so it's a little bit harder to read um so you can still lo look that up but in any case the the point of the video was not so much actually to to prove the halting problem or give this sketch of the proof but make you understand uh, what the uh, like the wonders of the recursively enumerable or computationally enumerable sets are that even if a problem is not decidable even even if you have a problem that cannot be solved that you can still get something out of it even if you just have this half-sided thing where you can answer it positively or it looks all forever you can still generate infinitely many positive results um, so there's actually a wikipedia page called undecidable problems um, and it lists a bunch of problems that are known to be undecidable. Uh, some of them are, so here, list of undecidable problems. Um, the big ones are uh, Entscheidungsproblem and I guess halting problem is here also. Um, but one that is particularly cool that I want to mention to end this uh, video is the mortal matrix problem so the this says that if you have generic uh, matrices of size uh, in this example for example 15 times 15 you're given two general matrices of uh, size 15 times 15 and then the question is 
whether or not you can multiply those matrices possibly with repetition um, so that if you multiply these matrices together which are you know algebraic objects simple objects um, give the zero matrix and it has been shown that there is no generic algorithm that you can feed two matrices and it gives you a yes or no answer but this is a much more like simple math like simple mathematical um, question like it, the halting problem is, is super important uh, but has a li little bit of uh, overhead this is a practical mathematical problem is an algebra problem so to speak i mean practical um and it's also understandable so i think this is one of the coolest examples uh for examples of this kind um otherwise uh if you're interested in that a little bit more there's also the the post correspondence problem this is also like a mathematician who did a lot of early things in this field this is even easier to understand but i guess i'm already at one and a half hours so i will i leave it with that um i hope that uh was not too long-winded and uh you, i got my points across hope you like this video subscribe to this channel and tell me uh if you want to hear more in this this sort of direction i actually want to go more back um to set theory and all these ties of course together um but um since i have a hunch uh like a, like interest in this constructive stuff as well um just tell me take care